Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about advanced topics in linear algebra. And in today's part 41, we will look at the connection between the algebraic multiplicity of an eigenvalue and the so-called fitting index. Indeed, today we will bring a lot of things together we have already discussed in the last videos. However, as always, before we start with the topic, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. Only because of your support, I am able to create these videos here. And moreover, as a reward, you also find a lot of additional material for the videos with the link in the description. Okay, then let's start by recalling what we already know about the so-called fitting index. The setup is always the same, we fix a square matrix A and an eigenvalue lambda. Then we can form a new matrix N where we just shift this eigenvalue. Then we know that the kernel of this matrix N is non-trivial because we know we have eigenvectors corresponding to the eigenvalue. And now we have shown that we can also look at the powers of this matrix D to possibly increase the kernel. However, it turns out that there is a minimal index d such that the kernel does not increase anymore. And exactly this number d is what we call the fitting index. And moreover, this fitting index also holds for the range of the matrix n to the power d. So you see, we have two important subspaces of cn. So let's give them some special names. Let's call the first one u1 and the second one u2. And in fact, in the last video we have already learned that exactly this leads to a so-called block diagonalization of the matrix A. This means that A is similar to this block form, which we can interpret as splitting A up into two smaller matrices. So we could say the first matrix here is A1 and the second one is A2. So obviously the first one corresponds to our subspace U1 and the second one to U2. And now to analyze these two matrices, it might be helpful to go to the abstract level, which means seeing n as a linear map. So let's say we have the linear map L from the vector space Cn into Cn again. So this means L of x should be given as nx. So you could simply say that n is a matrix representation of the linear map L. And since it's with respect to the standard basis of Cn, there's no real difference between L and N. However, the obvious advantage we have with this description is that we can easily restrict L to the subspaces. So for example, we can just write L restricted to U1. And indeed, we know from the video of the fitting index that this maps U1 into U1. Indeed, we know even more because if we apply this map D times, we will definitely reach the zero vector. This should be clear because u1 is exactly defined as this kernel. So you see, the result is that this restriction here is a nilpotent map. So we can find a power such that we can bring the map to the zero map. And we also know this is the minimal power we can choose with that property. On the other hand, we know that the second restriction we have is definitely not nilpotent. In fact, this maps the range into the range and there we already know it's a bijective map. And a bijective linear map is what we call an isomorphism. Okay, so what we have here are two abstract linear maps where we can find matrix representations of. And obviously these have to be connected to our sub-matrices A1 and A2. This is easy to see if we just consider A minus lambda identity on the left hand side. So you see, we just subtract something on the diagonal and this completely translates to our block matrices as well. The only thing to keep in mind is that these identity matrices have different sizes. However, we immediately get that these block matrices are matrix representations of our abstract linear maps here and there. So for example, the second one here has the matrix representation A2 minus lambda identity. And since the linear map is an isomorphism, we know that the matrix representation has to be an invertible matrix. Therefore, by definition, the complex number lambda cannot be an eigenvalue of A2. This is an important conclusion because it immediately tells us that the eigenvalue lambda is not found in the second block matrix of A. And now the question is, 
how many times do we find lambda in the first block matrix. And also this we can immediately answer because we have a nilpotent map. So in conclusion, the matrix representation given as a1 minus lambda identity has to be a nilpotent matrix as well. Hence, if we have this matrix to the power d, we get out the zero matrix. So applying any vector x to this matrix always gives us the zero vector. So you see, there are not many possibilities for eigenvectors for the matrix A1 minus lambda identity. The only eigenvectors can correspond to the eigenvalue zero, which immediately implies that the matrix A1 can only have the eigenvalue lambda. So lambda is the only possible eigenvalue of A1. And with that we have all the information we wanted for the eigenvalue lambda in our block form of A. And this is the important result of the video, the characteristic polynomial of A splits up into two parts. And please note, it's a general result, it holds for any matrix A with complex entries if we have an eigenvalue lambda given. Indeed, we can say something general about the characteristic polynomial we call P of A. And there you should know how it's defined, we take a complex number Z and send it to the determinant. More precisely, it's the determinant of A minus Z identity. And now since A can be written as a block matrix, we can use the formula for determinants of block matrices. And indeed it's quite simple, it's just the determinant of the first block times the determinant of the second block. So this means we have P A of Z is equal to the characteristic polynomial of A1 times the characteristic polynomial of A2. And now what we already know, of course, is that lambda is a zero of the characteristic polynomial on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we know that the first polynomial is of order k and the second one of order n minus k. And of course, this k is the dimension of our u1 space, which is given as the kernel of a minus lambda identity to the power d. So you could say the highest dimension we can get with the generalized eigenspaces of lambda. And now we can bring everything together, what we already know about the eigenvalues of a1 and a2. So first we see lambda is definitely not a zero of our second characteristic polynomial here. And in addition, we also know it's the only zero of the characteristic polynomial in the front. So this means we have exactly k zeros which are given as lambda. So we can write it as linear factors lambda minus z. And this goes to the power k. And now it does not matter how the explicit characteristic polynomial looks like, we just know there is a polynomial now which does not have lambda as a zero. So if we put lambda into p tilde, we don't get out zero, which means all the linear factors with lambda as a zero are in the front already. Hence this power k here is exactly the algebraic multiplicity of lambda for the matrix A. So this is the important result, the algebraic multiplicity is always given. So you see, the generalized eigenspace gives us the algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalue. But please note, the fitting index d is in general bigger than 1. On the other hand, we can also interpret that for our block diagonalization namely the size of this matrix A1 is exactly given by the algebraic multiplicity. And indeed, this is the key ingredient we need to form the whole Jordan normal form for the matrix A. And as you might already know, we will do this in the next videos. So I really hope I meet you again and have a nice day. Bye bye.